Hello and hold on. That was unprofessional. Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays are for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. Coming at you today with a new episode on the Timurids. Today we're going to be talking about the Timurids and the Battle of Ankara or Ankyra. Uh, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, the Timurids brought a brief uh, respite, or well, not really brief, actually a fairly a decently long respite for the Byzantine Empire and for Christendom generally when uh, dealing with the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and so today we're going to look at uh, the leader of the Timurid Empire, who was Timur the Lame, sometimes called Tamerlane uh, by Westerners. We're going to look at his origins, where he came from, excuse me, and uh, his impact on on our on our storyline here his uh battle with the ottoman empire so let's uh let's jump right into it i honestly thought about not uh right thought about not writing an outline for this because i know the story fairly well i know a lot of the stories fairly well but i it's, it's always good to have notes before we get going on this please make sure to uh like give this video a like subscribe to the channel if you are new and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Also, be sure to catch us on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And if you listen to us on there, give us a follow and a five-star review. So, <clears throat> like I said, we're taking a bit of a detour from our usual story uh, to bring you some important uh, back, kind of background, inf not, I shouldn't even say back background information, to bring you some, some real... Uh, a story that's going to have a, like I said, a serious impact on, on the story we're going through right now, which is Byzantine history. So, <clears throat> as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, the new wave of Ottomans appeared to be an unstoppable threat for the uh, both the West, both the Western Christendom and the Byzantine Empire and Eastern Christendom. Honestly, uh, Christendom had thrown their best punches against the Ottomans, but the Ottomans had. Uh, successfully dodged and counterpunched each time the West throws a punch at them, and we'll you know go through more of these later on. Uh, we still haven't we still haven't finished our our laundry list of uh, conflicts between Christendom and the Ottoman Empire, and it will go for go on for a while after our story ends in fourteen fifty three. But during this time period, the most serious threat to the Ottomans would come. Uh, not from the West, but from the Islamic East, from their own co-religionists there. Uh, the Timurids were Sunni Muslims. Over the years, uh, the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan had come to uh, take on a, a series of divisions. So the empire, instead of being one empire, is kind of split up into four uh, somewhat united, but also somewhat separate uh, empires. For certainly four main regions of the Mongol Empire. The portion best known to Europeans would have been the Golden Horde, which ruled over uh, Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe, as well as kind of the Eurasian step there, although that can be considered to go all, you know, much, much further east. Uh, there's the Ilkhanate, Khanate, Khanate, excuse me, or sorry, the Ilkhanate, uh, which covered the Middle Eastern portions of the empire would have included like Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, even parts of Syria, I believe. And then there was also the Chagatai Khanate, which was in Central Asia, which comprised of parts of modern Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, sorry, Uzbekistan, uh, Afghanistan, etc. Uh, and then there was the Great Khanate, in which was uh, China and the Mongol ancestral homeland there in modern Mongolia. Now, in the Chagatai Khanate was, a boor, was born a boy uh, roughly uh, 1336, although there is some controversy as to uh, the exact year of Tamerlane's birth. And he was born not far from Samarkand, or Samarkand which was the site of Genghis Khan's, prob uh, one of his most brilliant uh, victories, if you've never uh, read the story of how Genghis Khan uh, took Samarkand and defeated the Khwarezmian Empire. You should definitely look it up. It's a very, very interesting uh, story. Genghis Khan basically sneaks half of his army 
uh, through the desert and appears on a on a flank of the Khorezmians that they never thought that an enemy would approach from, which is which was just really really ballsy, a real ballsy move. Uh, but uh, so uh, Timur's uh, nickname, which was uh, Timur the Lame or Tamerlane, came from a childhood injury which never fully healed. Uh, some people say that he was shot uh, with an arrow while trying to steal a neighbor's uh, sheep. And later on when his uh, when Tamerlane's body is found in his tomb, which we'll talk about at the end of the episode, um, the, the skeletal remains do suggest a decent amount of uh, physical deformity, of uh, bones that look like they never quite healed properly. Uh, Timur grew up as a shepherd boy, but claimed descendants uh, from Genghis Khan himself, though he was probably not actually related to Genghis Khan, which is kind of impressive when you think about uh, someone living on the Central Asian steppe who was not, uh, <laughs> who did not have a relative who was somehow violated by Genghis Khan. It's actually kind of impressive. Some Something like, uh, 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 what is it, 16% of... Uh, uh, certain parts of Asia can trace their lineage back to Genghis Khan, or some ridiculous number like that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Tamerlane was an ambitious young general, uh, and he quickly brought the uh, Chagatai Khanate under his influence. He couldn't necessarily uh, take the title of Khan in the Chagatai Khanate, partly because he was not a descendant of Genghis Khan himself. Uh, and so Tamerlane has to do a lot of, um, he has to take a lot of extra steps to legitimize his reign. And one of the things that he does to legitimize his reign, we'll talk, this will probably come up later on. Uh, but he marries uh, a woman who is an actual descendant of Genghis Khan. And that gives his, that gives his power a little bit more legitimacy. But so early on in his, in his rise here, he can't, he's not actually allowed to uh, take the title of Khan of the Chagatai Khanate, although effectively he's he's running the joint. Um, and it was a grand it was a granddaughter of Genghis Khan who he who he married there. Uh, Tamerlane then expanded uh, his rule further west by conquering the old Ilkhai Khanate, which had basically fallen into shambles by this point in time. Uh, there, there's a bit of, if I remember correct, if I'm rem remembering correctly, uh, there was a bit of a power vacuum in in that area in the Middle East at that point in time because the Al Qaeda had, had, if it if it hadn't fallen apart by that point, it was it was close to it. Uh, and in three seven, or sorry, thirteen seventy, uh, Tamerlane was the most influential ruler in the region of the Middle East as well. So he he's got under his control both the Chagatai Khanate and the old Il Khanate as well. Um, so his dominion stretched all the way from modern Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan all the way to Iraq, which is pretty impressive. It's quite a, you know, that's a, that would be a fairly large portion of the, of the old Persian Empire from back in the Achaemenid days. Now with this westward expansion, the Timurids were bound to eventually bump up against the Ottomans in Anatolia. Now, Tamerlane did not want to attack uh, the Ottomans because the Ottomans were Sunni Muslims and the Timurids were Sunni Muslims, so he didn't want to attack his own co-religions. But he, uh, uh, Timur and uh, the Sultan uh, Bayezid, certainly exchanged a lot of uh, fighting words, I guess you could say. Uh, there's a series of letters of their correspondence with each other where they're just kind of you know, taking pot shots at each other, rhetorically speaking. Um, and eventually, you know, they, you know, they can't, they can't stand to have the other guy uh, lob another insult at him. And so eventually um, uh, this come, this war of words becomes more of a war of weapons, right? And so uh, Timur the Lame invades Anatolia in uh, 1402. Now, Bayezid obviously has to respond to this, uh, and with, uh, and this is going to give the West uh, some breathe, some time to breathe here. The, the the West and the Byzantines, and and Eastern Eastern Christian Christendom generally, 
it's going to give them some time to breathe because uh, Bayezid and the Ottomans have a serious problem to deal with here from the Timurids. And so when the Ottoman forces moved out to attack the Timurids, uh, Tamerlane conducts a, a, a brilliant end around the enemy. So basically what's happening is the Ottomans are marching from Ankara uh, towards the Timurid forces and uh, the Timurids managed to somehow get their army, which was not, which was not small. It was a fairly, I can't, I can't, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, it's not necessarily important. Uh, they managed to get around the Timurids, or sorry, the Timurids get, managed to get around the Ottomans and start marching towards Ankara, while the Ottomans have no idea they're still looking for the Timurids going the opposite direction. So it's an absolutely brilliant move there by uh, Tamerlane. And the Timurids manage to get to the city of Ankara, and then by the time that uh, the Ottomans turn around, it's almost too late. But so the Ottoman army then has to, along led by Bayezid, uh, they have to turn around and force march back to Ankara uh, in order to counter the Timurids uh, besieging the city there. Now, obviously, you know, you're, you're in a force, ma force march kind of state of disarray here. Uh, the, the Ottoman army, by the time they get to the Timurids, is pretty tired, pretty worn out. And the Timurids, they're, they're fresh. They're just, they're, you know, they've been sieging the city. Uh, they, it's, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're well rested and they're ready for battle. The Ottomans, not so much. And the strategic prowess of Tamerlane brought his army a crushing victory against the Ottomans. And most notably from the battle, uh, was that the Timurids captured Sultan uh, Bayezid, which sent the Ottoman Empire into real turmoil for the coming years because a number of uh, Bayezid's sons start fighting over who becomes the next Sultan. And uh, you get this kind of interregnum period for the Ottomans where there's no uh, stable, long-serving uh, Sultan for a while, although they, they will eventually recover. Um, but it's going to take a while, which gives, again, it gives the Byzantines, most notably for, for our purposes here, it gives them uh, some breathing room. Although they can't, <laughs> the Byzantines at this point in time are essentially still just holed up in Constantinople. They don't really make any sort of expansion out of, out of the city at that point. If anything, this is a better opportunity for Eastern Christian powers like, uh, like the Serbians and Poland, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Bulgaria, these people to try to make some do some damage against the Ottomans, which doesn't necessarily happen. Now, unfortunately for the Timurids, although they win this great victory, uh, Timur uh, dies soon after. So they, he invades in 1402 and uh, Tamerlane dies in 1405. So very soon after their victory over the Ottomans, does Timur die? And essentially the Timurid Empire falls apart as soon as Timur dies. Um, so it's a very, while it's, while it's an impressive empire, and, and you know, uh, I mean, uh, Tamerlane brought, uh, for example, uh, if you watch uh, the, the old uh, series on History Channel, the Barbarians, they did... Uh, one of the episodes on the Mongols and the second half of the episode is on the Timurids. And one of the historians they bring on talks about how uh, Timur built up his capital uh, into this great, you know, into this great city and brought in all these artisans and these architects and turned it into, you know, uh, you know, built these great giant mosques, these beautiful uh, uh, mosaics. Uh, it was a center of learning. Uh, center of architecture and so he does manage to accomplish a number of things in his lifetime but unfortunately uh and this uh, as i would i've noted sometimes you know the the longevity of your empire uh, uh a person's legacy after they die is something that also needs to be taken into account right certain certain rulers can ensure that their empire or their kingdom or whatever uh survives after their death which did not happen here with Timur, which you have to say is a knock against his resume. But an, a very interesting story, a story that I always found fascinating about uh, Tamerlane, 
comes uh, centuries after his death in the early 1940s. So the story goes that Tamerlane did not want his tomb to be disturbed. He wanted it to be sealed, and then that's it. Nobody comes in for, for the rest of time, right? So in the early 1940s, a uh, Soviet archaeologist opened uh, Tamerlane's tomb because, as we said, he, he was buried in Uzbekistan, modern Uzbekistan, where he was, where he was from, I believe in Samarkand. Um, and, uh, which, and so in the 1940s, uh, Uzbekistan was controlled by the Soviets. So on June 19th, 1941, the Soviet archaeologist opened uh, Timmerling's tomb. And there's a story that uh, inscribed on Tamerlane's sarcophagus was an inscription which read, and I'm, this is a direct quote, uh, whomever opens my tomb shall unleash an invader worse than I. And again, this was on June 19th, 1941. Well, for those of us who know our history, and if you're watching this, I'm assuming you know your history. Three days later, on June 21st, 1941, the Nazis invade the Soviet Union. So some people claim that this is not, uh, th this inscription is not, the, is not true, that, that uh, it's just a rumor that, that you know, one of the Soviet ar ar uh, archaeologists made this up. Um, but again, these types of stories in history, again, do, do I have evidence to support this? Not necessarily. Uh, but it makes for, a, you know, obviously it makes for a great story. Uh, that, that, you know, this inscription on, on Timberlane's sarcophagus actually came true because, so, I mean, certainly the devastation caused by the Nazis, uh, whether in Russia or, or anywhere else, certainly far worse than anything, uh, Tamerlane would have accomplished. And he was, and he was brutal. He was, he was one of these guys who would, uh, if a city would not surrender to Tamerlane after he, uh, took the city, he would exterminate the residents of it. He would, uh, you know, take not not just the humans. I mean, he would he would. There were stories of how he would take uh, prisoners and behead them all and create these uh, uh, stacks, these giant piles of skull of skulls. But he would also he would kill the animals. He would kill the you know the livestock. He would kill the rodents. He would <laughs> kill the flies. Like nothing survived after. Tamerlane was done with the city. He was truly a brutal, brutal guy. Uh, and also, something I find kind of humorous, uh, uh, Tamerlane's body was given a full Muslim reburial in November of 1942 uh, while the Battle of Stalingrad was going on. I guess the Soviets were hoping that they would undo uh, the curse, which is also kind of just, just humorous that the Soviets would make sure to give uh, this guy a religious uh, burial service, considering that the, the Soviets were militant atheists. So that is our, our brief look into the Timurids and Tamerlane and how they, how they impact uh, our story here in terms of the Byzantines. Again, the Byzantines just get a short respite from this. They're not going to come back from this, it's just, you know, they've prolonged, death has been prolonged for a little while for the Byzantines at this point in time. The Ottomans are going to need a while to recover from Bayezid dying in Timurid captivity and the interregnum period to settle down where, uh, to the point where uh, they have a set uh, successor for uh, for the, the position of Sultan, the Sultanate. Yeah, I guess, yeah, Sultanate, I guess would be the right word. Um, but anyway, uh, if you've gotten this far in the video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. You can also uh, follow us on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts or I believe Google Play, a lot of other pod podcast uh, platforms as well. This gets sent out to you, so if you're listening on any of those, please make sure to give us a follow there, and if you can, give us a five-star review. That's all I've got for you today, and I'll see you all next time.